Good afternoon, and thanks for joining us today for today's webinar entitled Nonprofit Organizations and the CARES Act. I'm Janice Snyder, Partner and Director of Assurance Services at McConley and Asbury. And with me today is Gary Dubis, Partner and Director of Nonprofit Services, and Jim Schellenberger, Principal with the firm. If you have any questions for us during the webinar, please submit them through the built-in questions function in the webinar control panel, and we will do our best to answer them during or after the webinar. There will also be three polling questions throughout, so be sure to answer those questions if you're looking to obtain CPE credit for today's webinar. Thanks again for spending some time with us this afternoon, and let's get started. Ah, there's a picture of our team, so hopefully many of them are listening to this webinar this afternoon, and we're grateful that they can join us as well as all of our clients and guests. Had a few pictures there. There's the team that is hosting you if you want to see our pictures and what our expertise are. I will say that we have a lot to cover today related to nonprofit organizations and the CARES Act, and I also would like to say that this information is the best information we have available today. Things are changing so quickly and there continue to be updates and new regulations and we're staying on top of those, but certainly they could change within the next few days, but we're going to share with you all the information that we have at this time. So I will start with a brief overview of the CARES Act. So it's the Coronavirus Aid, Relief and Economic Security Act. I'm sure you've heard so much about this since this was signed into law on March 27th, 2020. It is a $2.2 trillion bill and it provides liquidity through a number of items that are listed there, such as recovery rebates, loans and loan forgiveness, which we'll talk about today, enhanced unemployment benefits, tax relief to individuals and businesses, and retirement plan distributions and loans. Our specific agenda for the things we're going to cover this afternoon um, is listed here on the outline in front of you, and Gary is going to start us off with talking about loans. And then we're going to turn it over to Jim to talk about taxes and deadline extensions. So Jim got the fortunate end of having some positive news to share. Then I'm going to walk us through some unemployment compensation, paid leave, and employee benefit plan implications of the CARES Act. And we're all going to work together to walk you through financial reporting. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Gary to start talking about some of the loan programs. All right. Thanks, Janice. Hopefully everybody's having a good afternoon. And the first thing we're going to talk about today are the CARES Act loans. You see the Payroll Protection Program loan will be the first one we'll talk about, PPP, as it is uh, widely uh, utilized. Uh, that uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the very first uh, bullet point, access to nearly $350 billion in loans under Sections 7 of the Small Business Act, um, so literally today, the uh, internet is blowing up about the fact that this money is essentially already utilized. And uh, so all the funds are out, so to speak. There is obviously work at uh, the federal government level looking to uh, pass another uh, legislation to, um, to provide more money for this. And so that's what we're going to assume that there's going to be more money. Those that are out there that have gotten approvals of their of their PPP loans uh, should be fine. Those that have applied with their financial institution and has not got approved yet, uh, we'll all cross our fingers on that in terms of that getting uh, uh, funded. Uh, really, no no answer on that at this particular moment. So hopefully, those will also get funded. Um, so we're going to talk about these, uh, like I said, with the assumption that we're going to have more funds available for these. The, uh, these particular programs were designed to benefit small businesses and retain employees. That was the key aspect of this whole, whole CARES Act is get people back on the payroll of their employers, their companies, their nonprofits. Uh, eligibility for this, uh, nonprofit 501c3 organizations including faith-based organizations, 501c19 veteran organizations as well, are all eligible for these loans. Uh, 
Um, unfortunately, uh, other nonprofit organizations, C6, state associations, business leagues, social welfare organizations, C4s, were not eligible, are not eligible for these loans. Second loan, the EIDL loans, we'll talk about everybody, including all nonprofits, are eligible. This goes, uh, this eligibility is generally for fewer than 500 employees. There are some provisions out there also is that if you have more employees, there are some guidelines regarding revenue levels, um, how much net worth you have, those types of things. So if you do have more than 500 employees, you still may be eligible. And that information is out on our website, a little more detail regarding uh, regarding that. Uh, the covered period of the loans, of course, is from February 15th of this year through June 30th, 2020. You need to have a good faith certification that the loans are necessary. That's really not a, a, a non-issue. Um, and the funds are going to be utilized to retain workers, maintain payroll, leases, and utility payments. These, uh, these loans are a 1% interest rate. The first six months payments are deferred. How, however, now you might have six months where you don't have to make principal or interest, but the interest would, from the, the day the loan is, uh, is funded, would uh, interest would be uh, accruing. Although you can, in uh, our second part of this, discussion regarding loan forgiveness, you could get the loan uh, forgiven as well. So, and the maximum term of these loans are two years. You do get these loans uh, from your local financial institution. The loan amount um, is for 2.5 times your average total monthly payroll costs. If you guys have, uh, have been involved in our other webinars, uh, the other two that we've had regarding the CARES Act, we've talked about uh, what the total monthly payroll costs are. Uh, essentially, you know, uh, you look back a year and you come up with your average total monthly payroll costs. So 2.5 times of that could be your loan value. Next thing is that for these loans, there is loan forgiveness, and that is available for eight weeks after loan origination date for payroll costs, mortgage interest, or rent payments, and utility costs as well. Um, there, are, there are some questions, and I know that there's a lot of questions regarding loan forgiveness, because some of you have already gotten your approved loans, and now you're thinking about the implementation process for the loans. Um, we're not gonna be able to spend a lot of time on it, but, I, but one of the things I wanna certainly talk about is that once you get that loan, I think you're going to have a little bit of time to administratively get your people back to work and start that eight-week time period. So that's one of the questions that, that I know a number of people have out there. Uh, regarding the loan forgiveness, 75% of those costs that must be for payroll-related items. Only 25% of the loan forgiveness amount can be for other costs, for rent, utility payments, mortgage interest, et cetera. So those are the key things. And again, it goes back to the whole idea regarding these is get people back on the payroll out of the unemployment uh, compensation system. We're gonna talk uh, next about uh, the second main um, loan pr provision here, economic industry excuse me, Economic Injury Disaster Loans, EIDL, which is the, uh, the typical uh, name that's being thrown around out there. This expands loan, uh, loans under Section 7B of the Small Business Act, less than 500 employees for this as well, and includes all nonprofit organizations, as I noted before. Uh, for any loan that is made under this program before the end of this calendar year, a couple of key, key provisions of these loans are, one is you can get an immediate $10,000 cash advance that is not required to be repaid. This, in fact, is something that if you, re, 
if you applied for the loan and you were actually denied the loan, this $10,000 would be still a grant, uh, essentially, and it would be forgiven. Now, I've heard uh, already that this part of these EIDL loans is not happening within three days. Some people that have gotten approved loans have gotten like a payment of $1,000 with the other amount kind of promised. So the administration of these loans is such a significant challenge for not only the financial institutions, but the SBA as well. These loans for the EIDL loans can be up to $2 million, have a good interest rate of 2.75, 5% for nonprofits, and it would also be up to a 30-year term, and you use the money for working capital purposes. Operating costs, you could uh, actually use it for existing debt that you would have a higher interest rate on it. You could use that. You could use it for rent, repairs and maintenance, payroll costs, those types of things. And there is no loan forgiveness of other than the $10,000 cash advance. So those are the two primary uh, loans under the CARES Act. You'll see on the uh, slide next two pages is just a, a uh, summary of these two loans programs that was put out there by the National Council of Nonprofits. And there's also one other loan that you see on that uh, mid-sized loans those are for between 500 and 10,000 employees. We're not gonna spend a lot of time. There's not a whole lot out there regarding these particular loans at this point, although we did an article which you can find on our website talking a little bit about the provisions for the mid-sized loan program. So these, these uh, summaries are pretty helpful. I think we're, uh, are we over to the first polling question? Is your organization applying for any of these loans? Yes, we have already applied. Yes, we intend to apply. Or C, no. Please go ahead and vote. Just a reminder, this is not a right or wrong answer. This is for CP purposes. Those who are on the webinar uh, need to verify your attendance. While we're getting the answers to that polling question, um, Gary, we did have one question come in. Can you take both the PPP loan and the EIDL loans? Can you apply for both of those? Or are you restricted to just one? Yes, you can uh, You can apply for, for both of them, absolutely. Okay, great. And we are about to close the polls, so hurry up and make your election if you haven't already. All right, and there's the results. It looks like 52% of you on this webinar have already applied for your loans. Another 13% intend to apply, and 35% said no, they are not applying for these loans. So thank you so much for answering that. And with that, I'll turn it over to Jim. Thank you, Janice. Um, as Janice mentioned, I get to go over a couple of the, uh, call them the good news, or the, the some of the more positive topics. Um, I'm also, uh, it's also interesting to me that I was assigned the uh, the tax parts of this presentation being a, an auditor at heart, those of you that, that I've worked with and uh, that I know that are on the webinar. Uh, so I'm gonna work my way through this for you guys and provide you some tax uh, updates. Really two tax topics I'm gonna go over from the CARES Act relate uh, first to the payroll tax deferral. So in the CARES Act uh, that was uh, announced, uh, there's a deferral of the employer portion of payroll taxes that are due from the date of that CARES Act, March 27th, through the end of the calendar year. So that 6.2% Social Security tax paid by employers is deferred, that payment is deferred. So that's great news for the nonprofit community and small business community from a cash flow perspective. Half of that payroll tax that is deferred will be due on December 31st, 2021, and the remainder a year later on December 31st, 2022. 
Um, to note that the deferral, and as it's been noted uh, in various articles and webinars before, the deferral cannot be applied if you have a PPP loan forgiven. So those loans that Gary just talked about, uh, an important component is that the deferral cannot happen uh, if there's a PPP loan forgiveness. Now the IRS came out with some guidance uh, less than a week ago, back on April 10th, uh, to provide some clarity to this for, for the small business community. Um, PPP loan participants are eligible for the deferral. So I wanna make sure that that's clear, that if you have a PPP loan, you are still eligible to defer your payroll taxes. Once the non-for-profit organization receives notice from the lender, so the, the originating lender being the bank, notifies you that the loan is forgiven or a portion of that loan is forgiven, that's when the deferral of payroll taxes stops. Those payments still follow the same December 31st, 2021 and December 31st, 2022 payment dates. So once you have notice from your lender that deferral, or that your forgiveness has kicked in for your PPP loan, that is when the deferral stops. How is all this gonna be reported? The IRS is gonna be issuing revised Form 941s for Q2, so that'll cover the April 1st through June 30th period. And there's yet to be released guidance for that small period of March 27th through the end of March for Q1. So we're waiting on some other information from the IRS on that. Okay, I'm gonna go to the next slide, Janice. And just for a full disclosure, all the panelists here today are practicing appropriate social distancing. So uh, if you've attended a webinar from Janice, Gary, and myself in the past, there's a lot of banter back and forth. We'll do our best to do that, but we are in uh, separate locations. So mm -hmm. I can see my panelists and uh, on a video screen to my right, and they're all smiling. So I hope they, uh, they chime in a little bit as well. <laughs> and again, they're still smiling. So the second part I'm gonna talk about is charitable contributions. Um, we recently put up an article on our uh, COVID-19 Resource Center on our webpage. I'm gonna put a plug in for that about the charitable contribution, charitable donation aspect of the CARES Act. This is a part of the CARES Act that did not, in my opinion, Jim's opinion, did not receive the same level of attention as the PPP loans, the payroll tax deferrals that I just talked about, as well as those direct payments that certain individuals are starting to receive just this week uh, in their bank account. Um, as, a, as a recap, uh, individuals are able to take a $300 deduction from adjusted gross income on their tax return for 2020. That applies to all taxpayers who are not itemizing. So in the past, uh, you would typically take the standard deduction and not able to itemize charitable cash, charitable contributions on your tax return. Uh, now, because of the CARES Act, everybody who files a tax return is able to claim up to $300 of charitable contributions. The second point is that those who are itemizing uh, were previously subject to a 60% limitation of their adjusted gross income uh, on charitable cash contributions. That has been suspended for 2020, and that can be up to now 100% of AGI. So if you are a very uh, philanthropic person, you can deduct all of those cash contributions up to 100% of your AGI. Further, it took the corporate limit of 10% and increased that to 25% for 2020. So all good news for the, the not-for-profit community. I like to think of this kind of as a an opportunity, and I put a, uh, an article out on our website, uh, I think just Monday or Tuesday of this week, talking specifically about this and some of the things that not-for-profit organizations can be doing. Uh, a couple of those here are inform your current donor base to so those not-for-profit organizations, make sure that they know of these increased limitations uh, and, and deduction limits. Uh, make connections with your major donors, those who you have uh, direct connections with. Make sure you, you connect with them so that they're understanding of it. Think about new ways to share your mission and target some new donors that might be able to benefit from these increased limits. Uh, certainly in this, uh, this current situation, uh, fundraising events are not happening. So think about how those are impacted from a charitable giving standpoint. And I always encourage collaboration. Think about how you can partner with other not-for-profit organizations to really 
fully uh, feel the benefits from uh, the increased charitable contribution limits. Okay. Great, thanks, Jim. Thanks, Janice. Uh, we're gonna go and talk about some more good news, some deadline extensions. Uh, on March 19th, the uh, the OMB uh, extended the uh, the due date for certain single audits. This was a broad extension, six months in length, for all fiscal years through June 30th, 2020. So if you have a you're not for profit organization was subject to the single audit requirements and had a fiscal year end up to June 30th, you now have a blanket broad base six month extension of when your single audit reporting package is due to the federal government. Previously so, this, oh, go ahead, Janice. I love questions. Say, and, yeah, so your June 30th, 2020 year end, when would my single audit filing now be due with the clearinghouse? If you're June 30th, 2020 fiscal year end, your single audit is now due September 30th, 2021. So it's now 15 months after your year end that this is due. So that's quite a long period of time. For those calendar year end not-for-profit organizations, your single audit reporting package is now due March 31st, 2021. So 15 months after year end. It's an amazing extension. Uh, with the notice that the OMB uh, put out regarding the six-month extension, they also noted that uh, individual federal awarding agencies, so think of HUD, the Department of Agriculture, Department of Health and Human Services, those agencies were able to extend awards that were active as of the end of March and scheduled to expire automatically at no cost for an additional 12 months. So uh, for those organizations that have funding from awarding agencies, look for that communication from those specific uh, organizations and, and uh, departments regarding potential extensions as well. Some more good news on the, uh, the deadline front. Uh, tax filings have been extended. So on April 9th, the IRS issued a new notice that extended tax filings and payments that were due between April 1st and July 15th to July 15th. Okay, so that impacts a wide variety of uh, IRS forms, including the 990 series of annual information returns. So I'm gonna play uh, a couple scenarios for you. Janice, I know you're gonna ask me these anyway if, mm -hmm. if I didn't. <laughs> so if an organization has a June 30th 2019 year end. So we, uh, you know, looking back a period of time, June 30, 2019, your IRS 990 was due with extensions on May 15th of this year. So you have a little bit less than a month. Now that return is due July 15th. Okay. If you are a calendar year end not for profit organization, 12 31 2019 your return would have been due on May 15th without extension. That is now due July 15th without extension. However, you're still able to apply for the automatic six month extension that would take this return to due date out to November 15th. Okay, so the IRS took all those due dates between April 1st and July 15th and moved them to July 15th. Pennsylvania had to make some changes to its returns as well. So for not-for-profit organizations, file the BCO10 mm -hmm. uh, charitable registration mm -hmm. statement. Any registration renewal that was due during the months of April, May, and June have been extended for three months. So the BCO10 was required to be filed by the 11th, 15th day of the 11th month after year end. Now it's the 15th day of the 14th month following the close of the fiscal year, okay? If you haven't done, all, done it already, please download these slides so you get the information uh, in your records. Uh, so if in Pennsylvania, June 30th, not-for-profit organization with the 2009 fiscal year end, that BCO 10 is now due August 17th, 2020, because the 15th falls on Saturday. So again, it's pushing it out an additional three months from that due date. And the final, 
final comment I want to make is regarding the, the form BCO 10 itself. Uh, not great timing by the state, but they actually moved to an online system on March 20th for that filing. Um, that online system is not a required system to be used, so you're still able to file with a paper uh, BCO 10 like you have in the past, but you are uh, encouraged to file online. Unfortunately, the online system is set to automatically calculate any late fees and penalties, and it's not updated yet for these new due dates. Uh, and there's instructions regarding how to request a refund if you use the online system uh, and are subject to a penalty that will ultimately be refunded. So that's some good news uh, for the not-for-profit community on some deadline extensions. I'm going to go to our second polling question and ask the audience, do you plan on taking advantage of any of these extensions? Great. As Jim said earlier, these questions are for CPE purposes, so no right or wrong answer. And while we're giving you a moment to answer that question, uh, we have a loan question that came in, and it's, can a 501c6 apply for an EIDL loan? Gary, would you like to answer that? Sure. Yes. Uh, all nonprofit organizations can apply for the EIDL loan. So 501c6 organizations can go ahead and apply for that. Yes. We have one more question here, which is more on timing. So a 501c7 um, applied for an EIDL loan on March 30th, and they received a confirmation number, but no other information at this time. Any idea when they can expect to hear from, back from their bank? Yeah, that's a, that is a good question. And, and I know a number of organizations that are out there on this webinar are, are maybe in a similar situation. Just got to keep on checking with your bank to see where, where exactly it is in the uh, app, uh, approval process. Yeah, I know the banks are very overwhelmed with all of these really loan applications. Um, one bank told me, a large bank, that they're going to process more loans in a two-week period of time than they did in all of last year. So they're certainly struggling to keep up with the demand. All right, go ahead and get your answers in there, which I believe are, is now closed. And it looks like a little more than half of you plan on taking advantage of these extensions. Um, that's good stuff. I think I'm going to turn it now over to Janice, who's going to go into our next topic. Great. Thanks, Jim. So I'm going to talk about unemployment compensation and some of the changes that the CARES Act made related to that. So um, most of this is good news for the employee. Um, if you're the employer, in some ways, it, it can depend. So the CARES Act boosts unemployment insurance, offering $600 per week, um, up to four months for any laid off workers. And that's on top of whatever benefits their states are providing. So they were very clear in the CARES Act that the states cannot go back and reduce their unemployment um, because of this additional $600 per week. And just to give you some perspective, in Pennsylvania, our unemployment compensation runs typically just above 50% with a cap of $572 a week on current unemployment benefits. So to increase that by $600 a week is, is very significant. And there are large populations of individuals that will end up making more money through this boost to unemployment than they would have if they had continued to work. So that is some good news, I think, for the economy and for those individuals who can receive those benefits. Um, it also extends the unemployment benefits for an additional 13 weeks, up to a total of 39 weeks of coverage. And I noted here, here on April 2nd, the Department of Labor announced new CARES Act guidance on unemployment insurance for the states. And they're issuing a series of unemployment insurance program letters that are all out on their website and they keep they're coming out almost daily at this point. So just to highlight that to you. Um, there are two specific types of the unemployment compensation that is out there. And the first one is the Pandemic Emergency Unemployment Compensation Program. And this is the temporary program that provides up to 13 weeks of the federally funded benefits. Um, and I think that federally funded piece is important and that money will end up going back to the state unemployment um, that's there. And it's effective once all rights to regular unemployment compensation has been exhausted and it terminates uh, by 1231-2020, which is um, what is in the act. Pennsylvania specifically, each state gets to look at this and look at their weeks and their year ends and how they're cutting it off. And in Pennsylvania, this benefit will end on December 26, 2020. 
And for Pennsylvania, this actually um, kicked in on the week ending April 4th, 2020. In terms of the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program, up to 39 weeks of benefits, this is really opened up to individuals who are typically not eligible for other types of unemployment. Um, and these are uh, individuals who would be self-employed or who were seeking part-time employment or individuals lacking sufficient work history. So they will now be able to go out and apply for these benefits. Um, I know lots of individuals are still um, waiting for this to be finalized in Pennsylvania. I did check their website right at 1.30, and they did have a posting today that said that this will be available shortly. Um, so it said instructions posted shortly was the directives that they put out today. So I know lots of individuals are waiting to be able to apply for that. So there was one question that we've gotten um, from a couple of organizations we work with. It's what if you're self-insured for unemployment compensation? And the CARES Act provides that nonprofits that have chosen to be reimbursable employers, i.e. those who do not pay the state unemployment taxes, they may be reimbursed for one half of the amounts paid into a state unemployment trust fund between March 13th, 2020 and December 31st, 2020. So there is some, some support out there that they can take a look at. Um, and under subtitle A, section 2301, the emergency unemployment relief of government entities and nonprofit organizations provides for the federal transfers to the states to allow self-insured nonprofits, state and local government entities to cut their payments that they need to pay into their fund, uh, just what it's saying here, generally by 50%. So I wanted to give you the sections and the references there. And, um, that was some good news because a lot of people initially were coming and saying we're self-employed and, and we've already laid off workers before a lot of this guidance was finalized and now what are we going to do? Hey Janice, before we get into the next topic, I thought we could take a minute to answer a couple of the questions that came in to kind of uh, sure. keep things moving. So I did get a question regarding uh, the tax benefit on charitable donations and whether or not donations that are received after March 27th are the only ones that are applicable regarding those new limits. It's charitable contributions for the entire 2020 year. So as you're filing your 2020 tax return a year from now, it's all contributions made during the calendar year. Great, thanks, Jim. All right. I'll go back to the slide. So the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, I know this isn't technically the CARES Act, but I thought this would be important to note um, for employers because there's information that you had to post and there's a link at the bottom within your organizations by April 2nd. So hopefully you've done that, which tells employees what they're entitled to. And it affects all employers with fewer than 500 employees. Now I can tell you, if, if you go to the DOL's website and go through some of their slide decks and their FAQs, there is an exemption for small businesses with fewer than 50 employees. And you have to meet three criteria, and they lay that out there, that, it, that the employee's leave is to care for his or her child whose school or place of care is closed, um, and that the requirements of this act would jeopardize your business. But they also say, um, you know, as organizations are looking into that small business exemption, which would also apply to nonprofit organizations, um, there's a lot of hesitation around that. And certainly, if you think you meet the criteria for the small business exemption, I would recommend that you uh, seek legal counsel's advice on that and make sure you're following exactly what this act would, show, would permit you to do. So with this act, employees, it's basically having to pay for paid sick leave or paid expended family leave. And it actually puts it into these three different buckets that um, you have to pay the employee at the regular rate if they're being quarantined or experiencing symptoms themselves. Um, that is capped at $511 a day or um, the $5,110 in total, because that would presume 10 days worth of work um, over that two week period of time. And then for paid sick leave, you have to pay two thirds of the employee's regular rate. Um, and that's capped at $200 a day um, or $2,000 in total. And then you could also have to pay for 10 weeks of expanded expanded family medical leave under this standard. Um, 
and that's capped at $200 a day as well. It's the two thirds of the employee's regular rate um, consistent with the two weeks above. And it says the total pay cap is capped at $12,000 because that's 10 weeks at $200 a day plus the two weeks from above. So it ends up being 10,000 plus $2,000. Um, the DOL's website is great. They have great uh, resources out there. They have an example of what you have to have posted in your um, your place of employment to make sure that all employees are aware of this. They also have slide decks and some really good FAQs because um, there's actually six different buckets these three categories could fall into so that you can get all the nuances of what this Family First Coronavirus Response Act requires you to do mm -hmm. as the employer. And now I'm going to switch gears to the impact for employee benefit plans. Um, so the first thing that the CARES Act did for employee benefit plans was waive the 10% penalty on early withdrawals up to $100,000 for coronavirus related distributions. So essentially there would be no withdrawal penalty for individuals to pull money um, out of their benefit plans. The distribution must be made during 2020 to an individual or their spouse, um, and they have to have a diagnosis of COVID-19 or who experiences adverse financial consequences um, related to uh, COVID-19. And I, I think many individuals will qualify for that because they go on to further say that they have to be physically or economically impacted in order to be able to take this distribution. Um, Income from the distribution is taxed rateably over a three-year period, unless the participant wants to be taxed um, in the current year or even in 2019. And taxpayers may put that money back into the plan within three years um, and then not have any of those tax consequences related to that income. So I think that's some good news if you have a balance in, your, um, in one of your plans. The next item is new loans. So during the 180-day period, it already started. Um, it allows individuals to borrow $100,000 or 100% of their vested balance. Previously, you could only take $50,000 or 50% of your vested account balance. So they're trying to make more funds available to individuals to take out of their retirement accounts um, should they have that money there. And for existing loans, um, Plan participants are allowed to delay their current 401k loan payments for up to one year, but I do want you to know that you interest will continue to accrue on the loan and you will later be responsible for repaying the interest portion as well. So in terms of the DOL, the, the CARES Act um, expanded the DOL's authority to postpone certain deadlines. Um, and they've only taken one action at this point, and that is that any Form 5500 due between April 1st and July 15th is now extended to that July 15th deadline. Um, this is similar to some of the deadline extensions Jim mentioned for non-for-profits um, and other things, but um, anything due between April 1st and July 15th is extended to July 15th, 2020. It also looks at the required minimum distributions in 2020, and you're not required to take them out of your plans once you hit um, the certain ages that you have to take minimum distributions. Um, and this applies to 401k plans, 43B plans, 457B plans, and individual retirement accounts. Uh, I think the logic behind that is they didn't want money to have, individuals have to pull money out of their plans when the market was down, and this could create some financial hardships. So they don't have to take the required minimum distributions in 2020. For those of you that still have um, pension plans out there, um, so some of those defined benefit plans, there's still a few, I know. Um, so there's relief for failures to meet contribution requirements to the benefit plans. So you essentially don't have to make your contributions for 2020. Um, again, interest will accrue on those balances and you'll ultimately have to pay them in 2020 on January 1st, 2021. Um, and then for any other contributions to any other types of plans as well, it delays the due date through all of 2020, and you don't have to make those contributions until January 1st, 2021. So the one question, since I audit, we audit a lot of employee benefit plans, is how do you have to amend your plans or change your plans um, as a result of these increasing loan levels and uh, distribution levels? Um, 
And basically the CARES Act says that these rules are effective immediately and you don't have to formally amend your plan or vote on this until the last day of the first plan year beginning on or after 1-1-2022. Um, so certainly you have plenty of time to amend your plan documents to allow for these provisions as part of the CARES Act. And the amendments you would want to make are in regards to the distribution guidelines as well as the loans guidelines. Great. And before we get into the next section, I'll take a minute to answer a couple of the questions that are coming in. So again, remind everybody on today's webinar to send your questions in to us via the uh, built-in chat feature. And not surprisingly, most of these questions have to do with the, uh, the loan programs that everyone is talking about. So the first, uh, first one I want to address uh, is regarding, uh, Gary, I'm going to have you answer these ones. Uh, I'm a 501c5 organization. Can I apply for anything any of the loan programs? Uh, yes, uh, just the EIDL loan program. All nonprofit organizations, if they have a need, can go ahead and apply for that. PPP is not available to C5 organizations. Okay, another, another loan uh, question. Do any of the loans and grants for organizations cover paying independent contractors or is it just for employees? That's a good question. Uh, the uh, independent contractors, self-employed individuals can apply for the loans themselves and so they are, specific, uh, they are excluded from than a nonprofit organization's payroll, and you cannot get uh, loan proceeds to pay for independent contractors. So that's a good question. So those those people are ineligible for your PPP loan. One other uh, one other kind of note that I wanted to make is that there's a lot out there going on regarding how the funds have run out for these two loan programs that we've talked about. And, and our understanding is that, uh, that they're not even taking applications currently because the, the money has run out. Uh, and again, we're talking about the, the anticipation of additional funds to be provided for these loans going forward. So uh, we'll, we'll stay tuned for that. Uh, there is so much need out there, it's hard to imagine that there's not a second phase of this. Great. Thanks, Gary. So I said we're going to tag team the financial reporting section. Um, this is probably the section a lot of Gary, Jim, and I would be um, the most passionate about or most focused on as we look forward to a lot of our June 30th year-end audits. So I know some of you are going, I, I can't even think that far ahead at the moment. Um, so this is kind of a laundry list of things you will eventually need to think about. And I'm sure that um, as a firm, we'll be talking about these in more detail and again in the future. Um, so we'll start with that overview. But Gary, in terms of accounting for loans or specifically paycheck protection loans, are there specific things that um, nonprofit organizations should be thinking about? Uh, sure, sure. The, of course, you would have uh, potentially the loan payable on your books for the paycheck protection loan. And then hopefully uh, you also have debt forgiveness. And when the de debt forgiveness is realized, you would then have essentially miscellaneous income that you would be recording on your books uh, for the loan forgiveness portion of it. The rest of it, if if it was all, if the loan was not all forgiven, then the rest of the course would still sit on your books as a liability. Yes, and I imagine a lot of organizations will have potentially large liabilities at June 30th because the period that they cover and the payroll period goes up through June 30th of 2020. So there's right. potential that organizations will not have them forgiven by the time they're preparing their June 30th financial statements. I think you're right. I think that's exactly right. Janice, one of the questions I've received is whether or not that forgiveness is then subject to, to UBIT. And does a non-for-profit organization have to pay tax on that forgiveness of, of the loan? And the answer to that question is no. Uh, that would not be subject to, to UBIT in a not-for-profit situation. Jim, you keep getting to present all the good news. <laughs> I'm not sure how that happens. 
it's, it's called good planning. <laughs> so, Jim, you went through our taxes section. Is there anything on recording the deferred payroll taxes that you'd like to know? Yeah, obviously, uh, from a, a accounting bookkeeping standpoint, you're going to have a, a liability on your books that will continue to grow until that payment is ultimately made in 2021 and 2022. But it's going to be very important to to work with your lender uh, if you are a recipient of a PPP loan to nail down that date of when forgiveness starts. Because at, remember, at that date is when you can no longer defer that uh, those payroll taxes and have to begin making those payments again. So, yes, uh, you'll have a liability on your books until that is ultimately made. Uh, but again, working with your lender to have that, that key date of when forgiveness occurs to, uh, to restart payments. Great. Thanks, Jim. I'll touch base quickly on asset impairment. Um, we've listed a number of things there that you'll need to consider, um, such as can you really collect all of your receivables? And are the individuals who owe you those monies, um, are they going to be able to pay them to you? Hopefully we have a little more clarity by June 30th. But something we'll have to be taking a look at. And are you now sitting on inventory at year end that may not be worth what you thought it was worth or may not be worth what you paid for it? Um, you may need to look to some if you have contract assets um, related to some of the revenue recognition rules or anything of that nature that you would have to impair those assets. Um, where are your investments? Um, I know some organizations have investment balances or investment returns that can affect their debt covenant calculations. Um, and you certainly would want to be aware of how those investments could affect that. Um, also, if you have equity method investments, they may be impaired through this process as well. Um, fixed assets, um, you should be looking at, are there any of those you need to write down? If you happen to have goodwill or intangible assets, I think it's far more likely coming out of the situation with a lot of the closures and shutdowns and significant impacts to organizations that a lot more goodwill and intangible assets may need to be written down at June 30th. So Gary or Jim, would either of you like to touch base on closed or discontinued operations? Sure, I, uh, yeah. I can touch on closed and discontinued operations. Um, the unfortunate reality of, of what we're all experiencing is that some not-for-profit organizations and some businesses are, are having to, uh, to close their doors or make significant changes to, to the ways in which they operate. Um, that ultimately will come with a uh, requirement then for further disclosure within your financial statements. So um, again, this is a situation if, if you're in that to, to be proactive as much as you can with your, uh, your accountant and, and those stakeholders of your financial statements to get that information that's needed for the proper disclosures. There, there's certain accounting rules that uh, Janice Gary and I can talk about at length regarding uh, reporting discontinued operations and how to properly account for it on your financial statements. But just just know that um, there's going to be additional items within your financial statements regarding these two. Okay, and we would love to talk about them at length, but not today. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'll touch base. Business interruption insurance. Um, so I know some organizations have this and some don't. Um, there's certainly a question out there, will insurance companies be paying on this if you had to shut down in light of COVID-19? Um, some discussions I've had with insurance companies is that, that they are paying on these claims. Um, and if you're fortunate enough that you have this insurance and you filed a claim, you'll be looking closely at your financials at June 30th to say, do you have a valid receivable or have you been paid on that? Um, are you fortunate enough that you would be able to um, record that as of year end? And certainly something you'd want to be talking to your accounting firm with um, as you're going through that process to make sure you get the timing right. Um, in terms of mortgage debt, lease, and other payment deferrals, um, I can keep going unless Gary or Jim want to jump in. Actually, I let me uh, throw in another question that we have. Uh, on uh, the loans, uh, uh, can a 501c3 apply for only 10K, 10,000 in EIDL and get 100% forgiveness? And the answer is yes. Uh, you know, that uh, according to the, the rules, you can apply and get that $10,000 cash advance forgiveness. So literally, it's free money. Yes. Okay, thanks, Gary. 
So I'll go back as you look at your mortgages, your debt, leases, um, like Jim mentioned earlier, if you're deferring payments on your taxes, um, if you would have any forbearances on your debt or you're not able to make them, you have to think about what your um, minimum payment schedules look like and what's going to be current as of year end, how that could potentially affect your current ratio or how you're going to explain to the reader of the financial statements that you're going to be able to make those payments within the next year um, and the disclosures that need to go with that. We'll move on to the next slide with debt covenant calculations. Um, I believe all of the things that we've mentioned so far from current debt and current ratios to if you need a minimum tangible net worth or decline in investment values or anything like that that could make you fail any requirement of your debt covenants. Um, it's better to be talking to your bank sooner rather than later, although I would probably say right now is not the right time. Give the banks a little bit of time to, to adjust to all the lending that they're getting, but something that you'll want to be thinking out long thinking about long before June 30th, um, so you have the opportunity to get in front of that. Risks and uncertainty disclosures? Jim or Gary, anyone want to take that? <laughs> it's not great news, so I'll pass it on to, to Gary. <laughs> <laughs> How did I know you were going to say that? <laughs> well, when it comes to risk and uncertainties, uh, anything that's going to potentially financially impact you in a significant fashion uh, that are uncertainties, you certainly want to look to or towards disclosure. Uh, and, and, uh, and certainly in this environment, uh, you're looking at some, some potentially some additional disclosures, uh, especially in subsequent events. Uh, for a number of our calendar year clients that have, have issued financial statements over the last month or so and, and looking over the next couple of months. Uh, COVID-19 disclosure has become pretty much a, a common you know, regarding the uncertainties of the economic environment in which we now live, uh, the new normal, so to speak. So, uh, and of course, uh, 630 year ends, hopefully are gonna be uh, disclosing loan forgiveness. Uh, that'll be a positive, uh, certainly uh, uh, that, that may uh, be impacting your financial statements as well as a as a subsequent event uh, that'll, that uh, could occur after June 30th. Great. Thanks, Gary. You jumped right in there and took risks and uncertainties yeah. and subsequent events. Um, <laughs> we definitely would need to touch base on liquidity disclosures. As we said, as a lot of things come current, you have to say, can you meet your financial obligations for the next year? And what does that look like? And I think there'll be a lot of lengthy disclosures related to that. And these liquidity disclosures are unique to nonprofit organizations. So other businesses don't have that footnote and don't need to include that table of financial assets available to fund operations for the next year. Um, so certainly I think you'll want to put some time and effort into this um, as you get closer to your year end to make sure those liquidity disclosures say what you want and need them to say. Um, I also think that goes hand in hand with, um, we hope no one's in the position of a going concern, but there's more uncertainties this year than there ever has been before. Um, so as you're looking at those liquidity disclosures and other things, certainly something you'll want to talk to your auditors about and see what your year ends up looking like and what impact that can have on those financial statements. Um, and the last item to note there is our audit opinions. Um, so as we're looking at that, do we need to emphasize anything regarding liquidity or subsequent events or how COVID-19 has affected um, your business or even how the CARES Act and a lot of things we've talked about today has impacted the organization? Um, so certainly things to be thinking about. Um, as I said, we could talk about these all day, um, but probably not the most pressing issues of everything we talked about. We just wanted you to start thinking about them as you're either wrapping up your 1230-19 audits or moving forward to some 331s I know are out there and your 630 audits and beyond that, depending on what your year end is. So that leads us to our last polling question. So which will have the most significant impact on your organization's financial reporting? And obviously, you may not know that exactly right now, but if you had to pick one of these, which one do you think may have the most significant impact? Um, again, this is just for CPE purposes, if you want that CPE today. Um, so go ahead and submit that. 
So, and if you have any other questions, now would be the time to submit those as well. So we welcome them as we're waiting everyone for everyone to answer this question. I'm gonna give you all about uh, 20 more seconds to answer that question. Hopefully you found this is the last part of our webinar before we uh, close things out. Um, hopefully you found this um, helpful today and at least giving you things to think about or things to go look up or to contact us and ask more questions and get more detail on them. So we're closing this out in about three seconds. All right, so most people are very optimistic. Your positivity is rubbing off on them, Jim. I think I that's a good it. thing. Yeah. <laughs> they, are, they are optimistic that their loan forgiveness, um, so that's great because we know the majority of you have applied for loans, um, and hopefully um, that loan forgiveness comes through on those PPP loans, and we have positive news when we get to the year end. One, uh, one other additional question that came in is uh, regarding the PPP loan, as a church that has applied for the PPE loan, what happens if our donations come in strong and we don't experience any economic hardship? Will this impact the debt forgiveness? Uh, one, I hope that for any organization that things continue to be strong, so that would be a good thing. But uh, just take an example though, is if you're a church and you had 10 employees, full-time employees before the uh, the virus and this shutdown of, of operations, and then you employ them back again here starting in May, so to speak, and you have those 10 people back and working in your organization, you can get those those funds that you are spending on those payroll costs forgiven. And so, the interest, interestingly, the poll earlier that said, how many of the organizations on this webinar are not going to apply? It was a pretty high percentage. I believe it might have been 25 or 30 percent of you saying you're not going to apply. Rethink that. Um, hopefully there will be funds out there and rethink it if you are continuing to, to operate as a viable entity. The PPP loan uh, may be of value to you. Jim, we have a question about filing extensions, if they're taking the extension on their audit. Would you like to take that question? I'd be happy to. So the question is whether or not uh, an extension, there has, is there a filing requirement for the audit extension? The answer to that question is no. Uh, in reference to the single audit extension, that is a broad-based sweeping extension. Uh, the OMB does require an organization to maintain documentation within their own files. It goes nowhere. That uh, says uh, documents why the extension was taken. So what, what hardship did you experience? Did you have a change to your personnel and your availability to uh, uh, prepare for the audit, et cetera? So you need to maintain documentation, but there's actually no filing regarding that to be done. Okay, great, thank you, Jim. So I think we are just about out of time. I'm gonna turn it back over to Gary. Do you want to close things out? Oh, yes, I think that's uh, that's my responsibility here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> on behalf of McConley and Asbury, uh, we want to thank you for joining us for this webinar. If you have any further questions, uh, you can certainly contact any of us three presenters. We'll, uh, we'll do what we can to answer your questions. As Jana said earlier, things are rapidly changing, uh, minute by minute, seems like. Uh, a recap of today's presentation will be posted on our website in a few days. For those of you who need CPE, those certificates will be sent out within the next two weeks. Is there anything else that we have? I think, that's I it. think that concludes our webinar. I hope All everyone right. has a great afternoon. All right, everybody, take care. Thank you. All right, thank you.